appreciate all that are here uh, tonight. Appreciate Eric coming out and uh, helping us by leading us in song. Appreciate all our visitors. I'm glad that you're here. Sometimes on Sunday night here at Roy City, we have more on Sunday night than we do have on Sunday morning, which is kind of unusual for a lot of congregations. So we appreciate the presence of everyone here. We want to remember our gospel meeting starts next week. Now, next week, the gospel meeting will start on the evening, in the evening, on Sunday, and that will be at 7.30. We're not going to have a 6 o'clock service. We're going to move our 6 o'clock service to 7.30, and it will be 7.30 every night, Sunday through Wednesday, April 22nd through the 25th. And uh, we appreciate if, if you would spread the word about that and... Um, uh, be sure and attend and, and help us as we uh, try to glorify God and spread the gospel <clears throat> throughout this community. We have been doing a study about the Holy Spirit of God. This is our third lesson on this subject, how that we have looked at uh, the biblical teaching of the Godhead or what is sometimes referred to as the Trinity, how that there is one God, but God is not one person, God is three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We looked into uh, the Bible and we saw last week how that God, the Holy Spirit, inspired and gave us the written word that we have on our hands that we call the Holy Bible. And we saw last week as we ex ex examined the scriptures how that the Bible, the word of God, is the tool or the instrument the medium through which the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us today. And how that the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us through the message of the Word of God and not beyond that. What assistance or what aid the Holy Spirit or God the Father or the Son may give in providence is a whole other subject. But what the Holy Spirit does and what the Bible does when you compare them side by side, is the same exact thing. You conclude, therefore, that the Holy Spirit who gave us the Word operates through that medium, the message of God's Word, to lead us and guide us. Tonight we're going to talk about the indwelling of the Spirit. We're going to look at the fact that the Bible does teach that the Spirit of God indwells us. Now the reason we know that is because the Bible tells us. We would not even know that there is a Holy Spirit of God unless God told us in the Word of God. If you remember Acts chapter 19 when Paul met with some Ephesian disciples, about 12 men, and he asked them about their baptism, understanding that they had been baptized only with the baptism of John. He asked if they had received the Holy Spirit since they had been baptized, and they said, we don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. So it's based upon knowledge. It's based upon knowing the will of God. But the Bible makes it very clear that within the church and within the individual Christian, the Holy Spirit of God dwells. In Acts chapter 2, you find the promise given. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when those on the day of Pentecost were told that they had crucified the Son of God, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 that they were to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the study of the scripture that that gift of the Holy Spirit is referring to the indwelling of the Spirit of God within the Christian. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, we find that the apostles let us know that the Spirit is given to those who obey Him. Those who obey the will of God, the Spirit is given to them. And as we go through the pages of the New Testament, we find language that denotes that we are the dwelling place of God. Now this is based upon God telling us that. We cannot detect that with our five senses. We don't know... We don't know that that is a fact based upon how we might feel. It's based upon knowledge. Now let's see that from the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. As Paul is writing to the brethren at Corinth, 
he says this. He's writing to a church that's troubled and he says this, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Notice what he didn't say. He did not say, do you not feel that you're the temple of God? It's based on knowledge, not upon our feelings. He said, don't you know, as he's talking to the church as a whole, that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you, verse 17, if anyone defiles the temple of God, which is referring to the church of Christ, if you defile the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That word you there is in a plural. And so he's referring to the church as a whole, the congregation. He says, you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Later on in the same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. We find that the Apostle Paul is talking to the individual Christian. And he uh, uh, instructs the individual Christian in some matters of morality. And he says to them, your body is the temple. He says in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. We're joined to the Lord when we're baptized into Christ. We're added to the church, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. We are joined to the Lord. Verse 18, he says, flee sexual immorality or fornication. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Verse 19, or do you not know knowledge? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? It's based upon knowing the will of God. Verse 20, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or belong to God. You were purchased at a price, he, he is saying. The, the church was purchased with the blood of Christ. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Therefore, as a result of that, you don't belong to yourself anymore. And he's saying, don't you know that your body is the temple, referring to the individual Christian, the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. As a result, keep yourself pure. The Holy Spirit is in you that you have from God. Therefore, you live a holy life. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through chapter 7 and verse 1. The, the thought flows all the way into chapter 7 and verse 1. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? The temple of God there refers to the church. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17, therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Verse 18, I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7 and verse 1, therefore... Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and of the Spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. When we became a Christian, when we obeyed the gospel, which is the Spirit's message, we entered into Christ and the Spirit of God entered into us. And as we live the Christian life, we are living in harmony with the Spirit we are being led by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, through the medium, the instrumentality of the Word of God, and therefore we are the temple of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. He's writing to uh, the congregation of God's people there, and the book of Ephesians emphasizes the importance of the church. If you really want to know how important the church of Christ is, you read the book of Ephesians and you'll see. Verse 21 and 22, he says, In whom the whole building, being fit together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
Verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The indwelling of God in His people. Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 1. Paul asked a question. He says, This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. And he's asking the questions, uh, questions to the churches of Galatia as they were, they were going back into the law of Moses and binding certain activities of the law of Moses. He says, did you receive the, the Spirit by the works of the law, referring to the law of Moses, or the hearing of faith? That's the gospel message. The answer to that, of course, is by the hearing of faith. Galatians 3 and verse 14. It says, The blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Through faith. That is how we receive the promise of the Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul tells Timothy this, That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Titus chapter 3 verses 3 through 6. As the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus, he's talking to this gospel preacher about the grace of God. He says, but when the loving kindness, uh, the kindness of the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, that's being born of water and the Spirit, John chapter 3 and verse 5, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, the gift of the Spirit. 1 John chapter 4. In verse 13. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 13. Verse 12 and 13. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love has been perfected in us. We cannot see God. We're not detecting God with our senses but if we understand the love of God and we live the love of God in our life, God, the love, that love that He has has been perfected in us, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. So when a person hears the Word of God, believes and trusts the Word of God, and obeys the Word of God, and they let the Word of Christ dwell in them richly, Colossians 3 and verse 17. They are walking in the Spirit and the Spirit of God is in them. It's very interesting that in the Old Testament, the word Holy Spirit, those two words put together, are only found three times. Now the word, the, the phrase, the Spirit of the Lord or the Spirit of God is found throughout the Old Testament. But Holy Spirit is only found uh, three times in the Old Testament, those two words put together, and one is found in only two passages. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 63, verses 10 through 13. I found this to be very interesting. I don't think I've ever come across this verse before. Isaiah chapter 63, verses 10 through 13. God is talking about the time that He brought the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And it says in verse 10, Isaiah 63, They rebelled and grieved His Holy Spirit, so He turned Himself against them as an enemy, and He fought against them. You remember how the children of Israel would oftentimes rebel against the will of God. And as they would do that, they would grieve God. And he would uh, send a plague among them. He would punish them for their rebellion. Verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he 
who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock, where he, or excuse me, where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? Verse 12, who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them, talking about the Red Sea opening up, to make for himself an everlasting name, verse 13, who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they may not stumble. Now notice verse 11, verse 11 and 12. Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them, talking about Israel as a nation, verse 12, who led them by the right hand of Moses. They had the indwelling of the Spirit within them, yet the indwelling of the Spirit did not guide them. They were led by Moses. Moses was their deliverer and their prophet, their spokesman. Moses was, as it were, their Bible. Remember, he was the one who was writing some of the first writings of the Bible. Perhaps Job may be older than Genesis as far as the chronology of when it was written, but that's speculation. However, Moses was their prophet, and he was the one whom God was speaking through, Aaron being the mouthpiece, and he was leading and guiding them even though the Holy Spirit was within them. There's something that needs to be made very clear as we understand the indwelling of the Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit does not lead us. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit does not lead us according to the Scripture. The Bible says that the Spirit of God indwells us, that He is among us, as we live in, a, in harmony with His will and we're obedient to His will, we know by faith that is a fact. However, however, the leading and the guiding and the direction comes from the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the instrumentality through which He communicates, guides, leads us today. Now, we have to understand this as well. The Holy Spirit can be taken from us as it was of old. We have to understand that if we start living outside or we start teaching something outside the will of God, that we can become apostate or we can fall away. And if that happens, the Spirit of God can be taken away from us as uh, you find in the Old Testament. Look at Judges chapter 16 and verse 20. If you remember the context there, you have the judges who were uh, military leaders in Israel before there were kings. Samson was one of those uh, judges, and he was a Nazarite. He did not cut his hair. He took the Nazarite vow. And his strength, the source of his strength was in his hair. He was not to have a razor come upon his head. He fell into some bad company with Delilah. And uh, as a result of that, she seduced him, lulled him to sleep, and had them come in and shave off the locks of his hair. Therefore, his strength was gone. But notice Judges chapter 16 and verse 20. He awoke, it says, and she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before and at other times and shake myself free. Now notice what he said. I'm going, I'm going to fight against them like I had done before. There's not going to be a problem with these Philistines. But notice the latter part of verse 20. But he did not know the Lord had departed from him. When he woke up, Samson didn't feel any different. He could not detect within his body. He could not detect. And this is even when the Holy Spirit would supernaturally come upon those men and gave him supernatural strength to fight. Yet when he woke up, he did not know that the Spirit of God was gone. It's not detected by the senses. The Spirit of God can depart someone who becomes unfaithful. It happened with Saul, the first king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14. It says, The Spirit of the Lord departed 
from Saul. You remember when Saul was anointed, when he was chosen to be king? He was found among the prophets, and in fact the Spirit of God came upon Saul, and he began to prophesy with the prophets. However, when Saul became rebellious against the will of God, the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. That can happen to us as well. Because we cannot live in rebellion to the will of God and expect God to remain with us if we're not with Him. That is exactly why David prayed this prayer in Psalm 51, verse 10 and 11. He had sinned. He had sinned grievously. He was confessing his sin that he had committed uh, concerning Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, her husband. And it says in Psalm 51, verse 10 and 11, He's confessing and he says, Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Verse 11. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You see, David knew what happened to Saul. He knew that God departed from Saul because Saul departed from God. And when the temple becomes corrupt... God will remove His presence. You read that in the book of Ezekiel. When there was a physical temple on earth, a building, God's presence in a special way was there. Now we understand that Solomon said, the heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain God. But God's presence was there in the temple. When Solomon built that temple and consecrated it, the manifestation of God's glory came upon the temple of Solomon. However, when the, the people became corrupt, they became wicked, God's presence withdrew from that temple. Again, you read about that in the book of Ezekiel. We must remain firm in our steadfast uh, dedication to the will of God. We must live according to the Spirit, and that means we're listening to the Word of God, and we are remaining faithful to the Word of God. Some may ask this question, if the Holy Spirit dwells within us and He is not leading or guiding or speaking or, or causing us to be guided internally, then what's the point? What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit being within us if He is guiding us only through the Word of God? Let me give you three points on this. Here's the purpose. Here's the reason of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Number one, knowing that I am the temple of the Holy Spirit motivates me to live a pure life. Knowing that. That's why Paul told the Corinthian brethren, don't you know you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you defile the church? Don't you defile the temple? And as he talks about their individual body, don't you know you're the temple of God? Don't join yourself to a harlot. Don't go out there and commit sexual immorality. Don't do something that would defile the temple. Don't you know the Spirit of God dwells in you? So knowing that fact motivates me to live a pure life. Number two. Number two and number three kind of go together. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is given to us and we are sealed and we have a guarantee or a pledge from God that we are the people of God. Now that brings us to our final scripture, Ephesians chapter 1, the scripture reading that we had tonight. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. We're going to explore just for a few moments the significance of these words and how it relates to us as Christians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He's writing to the Lord's church, and he says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, notice the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. In whom also you believed, there's their faith in the word of God, and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14 who is the guarantee, some translations say pledge or earnest, of our inheritance until the day of redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. So here we see the sequence of events in a person becoming a Christian, so to speak. 
they have to hear that message of truth. He says, you trusted in God when you heard, faith comes by hearing, the word of truth, hearing by the word of God, the gospel, that's God's power to save, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, in whom also you believe, there's their faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can hear God's word all day long and not have faith. Faith that comes from the word of God is a faith in which we come into agreement in our mind with the word of God and we're going to, we say in, our, in ourself and by our actions, we're going to do what, God, what, what God's word says. Having believed, they became believers, they became obedient to the will of God, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, a seal can also be translated uh, as a mark, to mark with a seal. And it has this meaning in Greek, as a means of identification, so that the mark which denotes ownership also carries with it the protection of the owner. To put a seal upon something, uh, we even understand the significance of that today. A seal authenticates a document and proves its genuineness. A notary republic seal or a seal of an official uh, uh, document shows that it is important. It's an important document. It also, this seal is a mark of ownership. Seals you can find on ancient jars or uh, uh, brands on an animal, showing that this uh, animal within a herd or this herd of animal of animals belongs to a certain a certain person. Also, it is a mark of security. When something is sealed up, like railroad cars, they're closed and they're sealed. It means that they are secure. So when you find the understanding here that we as Christians have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, when we believe and we comply with the will of God, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, Who is our guarantee or earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession? We've been redeemed by our, from our sins as we became Christians. But there's coming a day of redemption at the end of time. The resurrection from the dead, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, speaks about that ultimate redemption that we are looking forward to. And all that's to the praise of His glory. Okay, let's look at the guarantee, the earnest of the Spirit, of our inheritance. That word earnest or pledge can also usually is translated guarantee. And it means the first installment or deposit, a down payment, a pledge that pays a part of a purchase price in advance and so secures a legal claim to the article in question or makes a contract valid. In other words, a down payment of something. God is making a pledge or a, a, a down payment, so to speak, that we are the children of God, we have been sealed by the Spirit of God, and He is that earnest that's been put down that says, as you harmonize it with the rest of Scripture, you be faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. And as we're faithful unto death, we're walking in the Spirit. And as we're faithful unto death, the Spirit of God dwells within, within us. As we are faithful unto death, we're living in harmony with the will of God and we are the temple of God's Holy Spirit. Much more can be said about this, but we will end there. Perhaps there is someone here tonight who needs to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and other passages, if you confess your faith, repent of your sins, and you're immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, you will be saved, your sins will be washed away, and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be a part of the temple of the Lord. If you've done that and you have grieved the Holy Spirit, and you've grieved God by going back into the world and, leave, and you're living contrary to the will of God, repent and come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours. While together we stand and we sing.